I've been talking to you since actually the last Sunday of last year about resolutions that heal. I've been trying to convince you that you've got to make the right connections. The Bible teaches us that we need connections with people who love us and love Jesus, and we don't need to retreat to a place where we've just got our own thing going, right? We make the right connections. Then I told you you've got to make the right disconnections. There are relationships that hinder, the relationships that undermine you, and dare I use that word which is overused today, there are relationships that are toxic, and we have to remove those relationships, or at least an access that they have to our spirit. Last week, I began to talk to you about making the right reconnections, the right reconnections. So are you following my outline? The right connections, <laughs> the right disconnections, and now the right reconnections. Did I say that right? All right, and I told you last week that we have to make sure that we are connected in the right way to God. For those of you who might not have been here, just let me give you a a moment background here. There was a time in the book of Malachi, in the time of Malachi, where God told them, shut the temple doors. I don't want you to worship me anymore. Can you imagine God saying that? Shut the church doors. I don't want you to come to church today. (laughs) Can you imagine that? Hey, by the way, what about those chiefs? What about those chiefs? All of you got prayed up in the fourth quarter, didn't you? I told you last week, if it comes down to prayer, we should have San Francisco beat. And when it came down to prayer, what happened? We didn't have a prayer, and uh, it happened. All right, where was I? Shut the doors, because they were bringing offerings and laying them on the altar that offended God. And, and God said, stop it. You bring your, your blind and your crippled animals and you lay it on the altar. About 150 years ago when my wife and I were going in the ministry, we were invited over to a young couple's house. They hadn't been married very long. Don't get paranoid if I'm over at your house. I promise I won't be sitting in judgment on you. But in this particular situation, I noticed something that caused me a lot of trouble for the evening. I noticed when I got there, the lady of the house who was preparing the meal looked as if she had been working in the flower garden. Under her nails were dirt. And I couldn't help but notice the person who was cooking the meal had dirty fingernails. And then I watched her make the hamburger patties, and her fingernails weren't dirty anymore. (laughs) And I was sitting there going, oh, God, help me. And she fried the hamburgers and served them up. And I didn't just pray, Lord, bless this food. In my spirit, I was interceding. God, I I pray against the disease and the bacteria and the filth that's in this burger. And I'll admit to you, you're never going to have me over to eat because you think I'm going to judge you. um, I remember when that burger was sitting on my plate and I looked at it. I thought, if this, if this had been in the day advent of, of cell phones, I would have dismissed myself to the restroom, sent a text to somebody and said, I need an emergency call. Call me out. <laughs> call me and tell me you're in the hospital dying. You know. But I, there was no cell phones back then. And so I sat there and I, and I ate the burger with whatever therein it contained. If you read Malachi chapter 1, God said, you people walk up to my altar and you sniff at it and you think it is contemptible because when you bring an animal to my altar, you bring the ones that are disgusting, the ones that are wounded, that are infected, And God never gets over what we offer him. 
Hello? He never gets over what we offer him. He wants us to bring the best that we have. And if you notice in Malachi chapter 1, he says, But my name is to be great among the nations. My name is to be great among the Don't bring that in here. Go to your herds and get the best bull you've got. Go to your fields and get the best crop you've got. Give me your first fruits or don't give me anything. See? Amen? I talked about that last week. Aren't you glad you missed last week? <laughs> and I talked about we need a new connection to the Word of God, where God is in His Word to us. Is, um, it's God-breathed. It is a teaching and rebuking, correcting and training exercise. And that's, that's where we are with God's Word. It is breathed of God. It's not a list of suggestions. It is the standard by which we live by. Amen? This, this is what we're looking for. So that was the, the second point. And you may remember last week I told you that when you try to make this connection to someone where God is first in your life, where the Word of God has authority in your life, and you're trying to walk out those relationships and have those kind of conversations with people, when you try to have those conversations with people, there will be one of three categories that everybody will fit into when you try to have an absolutely honest conversation with someone. And that is, number one, they'll be a wise person. And a wise person is wise because they adapt to the light. When the light shines into a, a wise person's life, they change to suit the light. That's true. I'm going to be like the light. They don't fight with... The, then the second person is the foolish person. And a foolish person will try to adapt the light to them. Instead of saying, that's right, I better change. They say, can we adjust that light? <laughs> the lighting's bad in here. Showing my blemishes. The third person is a wicked person. And a wicked person is a person that when the light shines into their life, they attack it. Because in their heart is destruction. And they will destroy the light rather than adapting to the light. Okay? Now I got you all caught up on last week's sermon. Let's just take a breath. You need a drink of water or anything? The third reconnection is with the safe circle with the safe circle. In the truly critical parts of Christian life, are you listening? Are you? You're going to need to understand the principle, I think you're going to need to understand the principle of private places and safe people. Private places and safe people. In private places with safe people who love God and love you, a great spiritual work takes place. We are being shaped in the image and likeness of Christ by the relationships we have with the people of God. The Bible says, confess your sins to each other. Can you imagine that? Now, I believe we're talking about private places and safe people. Confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. See how this critical connection takes place? That we sit down with someone who loves us and who loves God and we come clean. And then after we come clean, they pray for us and with us. And then the Bible says healing takes place. And the reason so often we are not healed is that we never have that encounter in a private place with safe people where God is working through someone and we're confessing to someone, I'm really struggling in this area. And they're listening to our confession and they're praying for us. What are we trying to get to? Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and self-control and faithfulness. That's what we're trying to get to, right? That's, that's the standard that we go. That's what we call fruitfulness. And when we get entrenched in unfruitfulness, it is at least partially because we're not having those experiences of private places with safe people. 
where God is working through our brothers and sisters to mold us, to challenge us, to elevate us. Amen? Can I tell you something? Can I, can I tell you, you? You got something over here? What about you guys? Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and whatever else is out there is not private and it's not safe. Hello? If you feel compelled to get on social media and air out your problems, prepare for them to get worse. Prepare for them to get worse. That is not a private place with safe people. In fact, I think people who jump on social media to air out, shall we call it TMI? Yeah. I think they are trading sympathy for improvement. Sympathy for improvement. I want you guys to feel sorry for me. I don't really have any interest in getting better. I don't have any interest in solving my problems. I just want everybody to feel sorry for me because I'm addicted to sympathy. Well, that's bouncing around out there like a pinball. (laughs) Have you ever been in a private place with safe people and confessed that you were struggling. And then they prayed for you. And maybe they checked on you the next day and they prayed some more. You are not as holy as you look today. You're sitting there in church like, I never sin. I got it all together. But you don't. You struggle. Some of it before you get to work tomorrow, you will have done your quota of sin just driving to work. <laughs> you don't have it together. Sometimes you're selfish. Sometimes you're irritable. Sometimes you're greedy. Sometimes you're envious. Sometimes you're jealous. Sometimes you lust. There's all kinds of stuff going on in you. You need, no, I'm talking about you guys. Let's not talk about me. Let's talk about you guys. You guys need private places with safe people who love you and who love God and who love you too much to give you a pass. Who are willing to yank your chain and say, you, you can do better than this. You're better than this. God's got something better for you. And I think about those times. Can you think about those times when your spouse is so irritating? No? Bunch of cowards? I, I can remember sitting next to my wife and I'd be all, you know, talking, can you believe they did this, 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 this? And in quietness, she says the most irritating thing Jeff, you're better than this. Why are you letting them get to you? Why are you letting them get under your skin? Please don't get down on that level. And you mumble under your breath, shut up. (laughs) But it's a private place. It's with a safe person who is speaking to you saying, listen, pull it together. Get it together. Who can get down into the humanity of your life, into the garbage of your life, and start shoveling it out? Those are the reconnections we need to make. We love the people who always say good stuff to us. We love the people who always praise us. We love the people who always spare our feelings. But we need the people who will shovel stuff out of our life and say, this doesn't belong here.
The absence of fruit is crying out. Confess your faults one to another. Pray for each other that you may be healed. And immediately we say, well, I don't need to be healed. I'm not sick. I'm not like Raina. I don't have the flu. <laughs> I'm doing good. I got my shot. <laughs> you know, I'm doing pretty good. But do you understand that if your life doesn't have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, self. Do you understand you need to be healed? You were created to have spiritual fruit in your life. The fruit of the Spirit is supposed to be popping out all over your life. And if it's not, we have to stop and say, there's something wrong. I need to be healed. The Bible says in Proverbs 9, verse 8, Do not rebuke a mocker, or he will hate you. What are you? What are you? Are you one of those people that when someone who loves you comes up and says, Can we talk? Man, you, you, got, you got some stuff you got to get over. Do not rebuke a mocker or he will hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Let's settle in a minute. Instruct a wise man and he will be wiser still. Teach a righteous man and he will add to his learning. You see, there, there are people you can't critique them at all because their ego is too fragile and they can't hear it. And so, when you try to be connected to them in a biblical way, they hate you for it. They get mad at you, they sulk, they pout, they attack. But a wise person will love you for the rebuke. Hello? Let's see. Now, we've got to make plans to reconnect correctly. You only have three points there to, to plug in, so this is probably going to be a real short sermon. <laughs> Ooh, there. All right. Number one, retrain your mind for reconnections. Retrain your mind for reconnections. What did I say? Retrain your mind for reconnections. I am, I am not a veteran. I never went to any of the military services. When I graduated high school, there was not much going on, and so I, I kind of hung out with the, the civvies. Uh, but I admire greatly the military, and I'm fascinated by them, and I, I like to listen when they talk. And one of the things I heard recently that I immediately I wrote it down, someone asked a Navy SEAL guy, you know, the Navy, you remember SEAL Team 6 took out Osama bin Laden? So, so I, I, I know I would get in trouble to say that they are the elite fighting force because we all know it's, it's the Marines. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, what, what, are we, <laughs> what is it? Is it the Marines? All right. But anyway, for some reason, we sent in SEAL Team 6. Okay? And, and uh, someone asked one of the Navy SEALs, how do you rise to the challenge? Because you guys do the impossible. You scale walls. You, you do all kinds of incredible acrobatics to accomplish. How do you rise to the challenge? SEAL team member said, you don't rise to the challenge. You fall to your training. You fall to your training. When push comes to shove, you will fall to your training. Whatever you've been training to do, that's what you will do. You have to, I have to retrain my mind for reconnections. I have to think about it in a way that I can move back and say, how am I going to do this right? We deal with opposition in the way that we've trained ourselves to deal with opposition. Do we train our mind in times when push comes to shove and life gets difficult? Have we trained our minds to exalt Christ? 
Things are real tough. Things are challenging. I'm mad. I'm upset. I've got a problem. Can I train my mind to say, at this moment, I need to exalt Christ? Can I train my mind to submit to the authority of Scripture? I'm going through a tough time. I'm going to find direction in the Word of God. I'm going to do things biblically. Or do I speak when God is saying, be quiet? Can I train myself to say, now is an excellent time for me just to be quiet? No amens there? Do we neglect prayer when we need it the worst? Do we, we're in the pinch of the moment and, and we say, oh, I've got to find a place to pray because I'm in a very difficult situation. Help me, God, to find a place to pray. And here's a big one. Do I get so focused on what I can see that I become blind to the unseen? The Bible says that I battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual darkness of this world. Do I remember that? Do I think my battle is not what I see in front of me? My battle is the spiritual forces that are attacking this situation. Amen? In the heat of the battle, carnality often wins. In the heat of the battle, immaturity often wins. We have to retrain ourselves to say, now this is the time for critical connections. This is the time in the intensity of this battle. I don't need to be a lone ranger. I need to lean on the people that God has put in my life to hold me accountable to do things His way. I have to retrain my mind in that way. Because some of us have a real tendency in the intensity of a difficult situation to withdraw to ourselves and to hide from everybody else. When we need private places and safe people, we've got to train our mind to that. This is, this is why God put these people in my life. Can I go on? You guys all right? Now, I'm going to bring up the next point. Don't fill in the, the blank yet, Tiffany. It is develop the ability to metabolize. Now, Tiffany's going to put a line in there that I changed last night. Go ahead and put it in there. I don't want you to put failure on that line. I want you to put loss. Loss. Sometimes loss is failure, but not always is loss failure. Sometimes we fail, and that is a big loss, but sometimes we lose something that's not necessarily failure. It just, we just lost it. Someone died. It's a loss. It's not a failure on our part. It's a loss. Um, someone divorced you. It's, it's, you didn't fail. You lost the part. You know. So where you see all that, let's, let's put loss in that particular blank. I like the word, and I borrowed it from a Christian psychologist, Henry Cloud, metabolized loss. Metabolized loss. Think about metabolism. You eat a bunch of food, and you gain a bunch of weight. No, you, <clears throat> you eat a bunch of food, your body takes it in, it sorts through it, it metabolizes it, it burns some of it up in energy, it decides, we don't want any of this stuff, and it expels it. And then that meal is gone. As good as it was, it's gone. You may remember it with fond memories, but it's gone. And so we talk about metabolizing loss. It's we have to take in that loss. We have to sort through it, learn through it, but eventually we have to say, this has been accomplished, and this has been expelled. Now I will move on. On the surface, it appears that we are dealing with something that's unrelated to the subject. Metabolizing loss, what's that got to do with connectivity? Well, I want to tell you that being connected biblically is critical to moving beyond loss. 
Being connected is critical to metabolizing losses and setback in your life. Spiritually healthy relationships help us process loss well. What happens when someone loses something great like a loved one or goes through a tremendous difficult time? We run to them because we realize there is healing in relationships. We try to move in closer and hang on to them tighter because we realize that there is healing in relationships. Come on, amen. We realize that and that's why we rush to them in times like this. But unless we deal effectively with loss, we become entrenched in loss. i got to say that again. I know it's deep. Unless we deal with loss effectively, we become entrenched in that loss. And all around you today, if you would look around and pay attention, there are people who are entrenched in an unfruitful life. Now, unfruitful. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, what? Faithfulness, goodness, self-control. Those things are not in their life anymore because they are entrenched in loss. Loss has driven out the fruit of the Spirit, and they are entrenched in that loss. And when you talk to them, you don't see the Holy Spirit creating in them love, joy, peace, and patience. You don't see the fruit of the Spirit because all you see is loss. Someone I needed died. Someone I loved left me. Something I needed abandoned. And so there is this loss that has come in and has entrenched us in perpetual fruitlessness. Am I making any sense? Are you with me? God has blessed you with an incredible mind. Just use it. Just just let it work. It'll work. It'll process this stuff. Now I want you to find a place on your sermon section because I'm going to give you some extra material now. You'll be tested on this tomorrow. This, oh, this came to me last night. That's why you don't have it in your notes now. There is a process by which entrenched fruitfulness takes place. There is a process by which in, entrenched fruitlessness. Goes. I know that... Slow down, slow down, Jeff. Okay. I know that we all have seasons when there's not much fruit when there's not much love, joy, peace, patience, all that. I'm talking about when it becomes entrenched in us, and that's who we are. And there's a process by which we entrench this fruitlessness. Here's how it starts. It starts with us in a situation where we tolerate what is unhealthy for us. We tolerate what is unhealthy. Did you get that down? We tolerate what is unhealthy for us. In other words, something comes into our life, usually taking the form, listen very carefully, of disobedience to Christ. Something comes into our life that is disobedient to Christ, and we feel bad about it, and we know it's wrong, and we know it shouldn't be there, but we tolerate it. (sighs) Man, I wish this wasn't here. Man, I wish I didn't have this weakness. Well, I just wish I didn't have those thoughts. I wish I didn't have this quirk. But we tolerate it. Instead of going to our safe place, our private place with safe people, and saying, there's something taking root in my life that should not be there. Instead, we tolerate it. Second thing we do is we accommodate it. We accommodate it. We, We tolerate it then we accommodate. In other words, we start making arrangement for it to stay in our life. I'm in a situation right now. Can I, can I tell you that? Is this a safe place? All right. I'm in a place right now and have been for a few months where most of my clothes are very uncomfortable. I stood at the foot of the bed this morning and I put on my pants and I went (gasps) and I said to my wife, what happened to my pants? And she said, I washed them. Shut up. 
So I said to myself, I've been doing real well <laughs> since the new year. I've been, well, I got this Fitbit on, and I've been walking 10,000 steps a day. It just blows, you know, so I, I've been, but I haven't been watching what I'm eating. I'm still eating like anything that'll hold still, I eat it, you know. <laughs> but if I decide to go out and bunch, buy a bunch of new clothes, a size or two bigger, I have accommodated it. See? But now, every time I button my pants, I say to myself, Get your act together. That Twinkie is not worth it. Right? And sometimes, when there's something spiritually, listen, something spiritually unhealthy in our life, we accommodate it. We start changing our life around so that it becomes comfortable. So, we have... The ability to tolerate it, accommodate it. Number three, we justify it. We justify it. Something that just two steps ago we knew was wrong, now we're not so sure it's wrong. Two steps ago we knew God wasn't happy with this staying in our life, but now we're starting to say, well, you know, everybody's got problems. Everybody, you know, so, you know who are you to judge me? And I can just pretty much guarantee you about 99% of the time when someone says, who are you to judge me, what they're saying is, I am defending my sin and I don't want you to deal with anything to do with it. I close the door. We defend the thing that is unhealthy. The very thing that is causing us to be fruitless, we begin to defend it. And so we, we can't be fruitful because we're defending the reason that we are unfruitful. Make sense? So we begin to justify. I skipped ahead. Didn't we? we justify it. Then we begin to defend it. And then fifth, we celebrate what is unhealthy. We celebrate it. At this point... We have entrenched ourselves in fruitlessness. Now, wow, this is just who I am. Now you say stuff like, I'm chubby in a cute kind of way. See, I saw the other day, that there's another recall on romaine lettuce? Did you see that? You salad eaters are risking your life. When's the last time Dunkin' Donuts recalled a donut? When's the last time they put out a call, that long John has got bacteria in it? No. Play it safe. Eat a donut. Revival is breaking out now. <laughs> many, many years ago, my wife and I were pastoring as our, our first full-time pastor out of college. And we had this uh, family in the church. It was, it was two sisters. It was far enough removed. I think I can talk about it without getting in trouble. And uh, it's two sisters. They were, they were elderly women. They had never been married. They'd lived together their whole life. And... and, and, and uh, uh, they loved when you'd come see them. Neither one of them drove, so they were kind of shut in. So I soon realized that one of their favorite things in all the world was a bad report from the doctor. When they would get a ride to the doctor and come back, and I'd swing by their house, and I knew if they were sitting in there going, I'd say, so what happened? I've got this terrible disease. You won't believe it. He said this, this, this. And they would just be giddy about it. And if they got put in the hospital, it was cause for great celebration. 
It, it gave them the attention they, they longed for. But the thing I noticed is that they celebrated illness. If you're not careful, you will celebrate illness. That's just me. I got a high temper. <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> It's just me, I, you know, I drink too much. <laughs> yeah, that's just me. I, man, I love that the drugs make me, and, and we celebrate the illness, right? We celebrate what is destroying our fruitfulness. Be careful. When something unhealthy moves into your life, You'll tolerate it. You'll accommodate it. You'll defend it. You'll justify it. And then you'll celebrate it. But if you had the right connections in your life, when something unhealthy came into your life, a person or two would say, Can we talk? Can we sit down and just visit? And they would love you too much to let you stagger on down the road to entrenched fruitlessness. Wow, come on. They would love you too much. They would confront you and talk about, wow. Maybe this is just for somebody you know. <laughs> right? Share this, these notes with somebody that it applies to because we know it's not relevant to you, right? Some people have experienced a chain of similar events that work like this. They meet a new friend, a new Christian friend. They establish a new relationship in Christ. They get close in that new relationship with someone in Christ. Fast forward a little bit, and that new friend in Christ bails out on them. And then they go find another new friend, and then that friendship gets close, and then that friendship results in someone bailing out of that friendship. And what happens is people abandon relationships that are chronically unhealthy that have these things I'm talking about here. A healthy relationship has healthy connections. You know what? You know what? <laughs> Do you really want to know? This is going to be really dangerous for me to talk to you about this. Beg me a little bit to take the risk. It's third down and 15, and I'm going to throw it 60 yards. <laughs> I promise you, if you're struggling and you ask me for help, I'll help. I'll pray with you. I'll meet with you. I'll agonize with you. I'll do everything I can. But when you decide you don't want to get better, I don't have time anymore. When you decide you want someone else to work harder on your, relation, on, on your life than you're willing to work on your life, almost everybody you know will bail out on you at that moment. When you become chronically entrenched in fruitlessness and you have no interest and changing. People will go, wow. This is, this is like trying to dip the ocean dry with a cup. This is a bottomless pit. This person's never going to get okay. Okay, now we got to go. Do you have that great thing in front of you? Number three, and I was worried I wouldn't have enough material to fill the time today. That just never happens, does it? <laughs> Accept solutions that are beyond 
your intelligence. Accept solutions that are beyond your intelligence. There's a guy or a gal or a whole bunch of guys and a whole bunch of gals locked away in a laboratory somewhere, and they're doing all kinds of experiments and mixing this and mixing that and, and murdering mice. <laughs> and eventually they come up with this pill. You get sick. And your doctor hands you that pill. And you take it and you get well. You have no idea the intelligence in that laboratory that created that pill. But you take it anyway. And you get well. Let me tell you today. You will never figure out how this works and you'll never be able to reproduce it, but God created a plan to make you fruitful. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, faithfulness. God created a pill, and he's so smart, and we're so not. Just take the pill. Just take, you'll never figure it out. Just take it. Just take it. God did this in his own intelligence, in his own wisdom. I don't understand how it works. I don't understand why it works. I just know that God has created an antidote for our fruitlessness. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is, is like a landowner who went to his vineyard to get some figs off of a fig tree. For three years in a row, there were no figs on the fig tree. The fig tree wasn't figgy. The landowner said, cut it down. Why should it take up any space in my vineyard? An advocate stepped in and said, give me one more year. I will break up the hard ground around it and I will fertilize it and let's see if it'll be fruitful next year. Let's just see. Let's give it another chance. You may be living a fairly fruitless life. Not much love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self -control. There may not be a lot of that in it. But the advocate has offered to come in and break up the ground around your root system and fertilize it. And let's just see. I don't know. I mean, don't, don't say anything right now. But are you ticked off at me? <laughs> see, don't, don't act like, yeah, don't tip your hand. Smile when you're mad. <laughs> it shouldn't matter to you how God does this. What should matter to you is whether or not I'm telling you the truth. Whether or not I'm telling you the truth. Am I telling you the truth? You can wrestle with it. You can look at the passages I've used and, and try and figure out did Pastor Jeff tell me the truth today? Because if I told you the truth, if I just simply represented to you what God said in his word, and I just brought it to your attention, you don't have to understand it. You just have to know this is true. And now, now is where I need you to chomp down on those dentures, grab hold of the wig. <laughs> we don't want it to bounce off if the road gets rough, you know. If you don't have private places and safe people, the ground around your root system is never going to get broken up, and the fertilizer is never going to get in there. I'm not talking about a drinking buddy. I'm not talking about a partying buddy. I'm talking about 
a brother, sister in Christ who will look you in the eyes and say, there's something going wrong in your walk with Jesus. Let's open the Bible. Let's, let's talk. Somebody who will say, you know what? I noticed that you're really developing a negative attitude lately. Where is your faith? I've really noticed that, man, you're kind of, your attitude is moving in the, you see, uh, <laughs> we defend against the very truths that will save us. How many times have I gotten in trouble for sitting down with someone and saying, you do realize that what you're doing is unbiblical. I mean, I'm not your judge, but I am your pastor. And you do realize that God's not okay with this according to his word. And you see that. Well, who are you? You go, just, just opening the word. I hope you've got people in your life that tick you off once in a while. I do. I hope you've got people in your life who hear your language and go, Hey, what's going on with you? To use a, a football metaphor, I hope you've got somebody that's throwing a flag once in a while. <laughs> Illegal procedure. All right, I got to quit, don't I? You got to have the right connections. You got to make the right disconnections. And you got to make the right reconnections. Next week, I'll tell you about living out those connections. I have, I'm going to introduce you to you. This is who you are in Christ. But it's next week. But today, I want to tell you, friend, my brother, my sister, there's something critical missing if you don't have private places and safe people who are helping you improve you amen there's something you can't be fruitful until you get there bow your heads with me please forget it was a critical moment in my life I was a young man a call of my life and yet there was a part of my life that was not surrendered to Jesus I was even doing the ministry thing a little bit but there was a part of my life that was a contradiction one night after church man who loved Jesus and loved me cornered me. And as quietly and privately as he could in that context, he said, you do understand, don't you? That you're not going to get away with saying, do what I say and not what I do. You do understand that's going to fall apart, don't you? went home offended went to my bedroom to pout and the Holy Spirit met me there and said this is a critical time in your life Jeff nothing that was said tonight was out of bounds it's the truth you're attacking the truth pivot in my life that night say I'm going to have to if I'm, if I'm going to be a Christian I'm going to have to be one I can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the church I'm going to have to be one I needed a private place and a safe person to corner me 
with truth I was avoiding. In all of our lives, those seasons will come. My friend, if you have walled off yourself from those conversations, you've walled off yourself from fruitfulness. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, help us. Help us, Lord. Help us look around us. Not everybody qualifies to be a safe person. Lord, there's a few. There's a few people who love us, who loved you. As iron sharpens iron, they'll sharpen us. Help us, Lord, to find those people and connect with them to let down the wall and let down the barrier and be the men and women of God that we can be. That the love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control, that all those things will begin to take shape in our life because we have been challenged by godly relationships. Father, I pray for anyone today who is resisting that. I, I ask you, soften their heart. Challenge them, Lord, to walk faithfully to you, with you and with their brothers and sisters. And Lord, if there's anyone here today that does not know you as Savior, as Lord, give them the faith right now to believe in their heart that when you died on the cross, you died for every single one of their sins, past, present, and future. That you died for all of their sins and now at this point you are just waiting for them to receive that forgiveness. And as they believe in the heart and confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord, they are receiving that forgiveness. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen.